good evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam. Welcome to Data and Society. Uh, this data bite, thank you. This data bite is dedicated to this incredible new work of memoir, Uncanny Valley, and our guest, the author Anna Wiener. This memoir of working in Silicon Valley is a rare first person glimpse into this high flying, reckless startup culture at a time of unchecked ambition, unregulated surveillance, wild fortune, and accelerating political power. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker, Anna Wiener. Anna is a contributing writer to The New Yorker, where she writes about Silicon Valley, startup culture, and technology. Welcome. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you guys for coming. This is very exciting for me, hopefully for you too. Um, for those interested in how colonialism might intersect with technology, I recommend looking into some of the um, seasteading communities and or new urbanism projects that are coming out of the valley. Um, so I thought today I was thinking about what to, um, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's OK. It wasn't very funny, because um, it's quite grim, uh, <laughs> like much of the material in this book. Um, I've never given a talk before, and so I was thinking while putting one together about what my public speaking experience has been. And appropriately, I think the most extensive public speaking I've done has been for um, a company I used to work for, which made a data analytics product, um, and for whom I used to run a bi-weekly webinar explaining how this product worked. Um, so I'm just going to do this webinar for you guys tonight. Um, but actually, it's, it's useful, I think, in talking about my book and some of the stuff I want to talk about tonight to just actually kind of give you a rundown about, um, about this product. So this was a product analytics um, company, and it was really focused on engagement, which was how users were interacting with different digital products, apps, or websites. And we broke data down into what we called events and properties. And I, I'm slipping into webinar voice. I'm so sorry. Um, and the, the selling point of this software was that events could be analyzed at the micro level, at the sort of property level. And so we used phrases like drill down and splice, um, sort of like we were working in construction or um, a laboratory. And I think actually the sort of uh, use of language and obfuscation that happens with language in tech is, is fascinating and probably subject for another time. But um, you could see that in, in these sort of concrete metaphors. Um, so an event, if you were in a dating app, might be something like open a profile, and then that event would be loaded with different um, properties. And so that could be anything like metadata about the person opening a profile, well, you know, their gender, their sexual preferences, their um, favorite movies, their political affiliation, and then anything that was associated with that profile itself. Um, and so the idea was that you could, um, you know, how, how many people who identify as women who live in New York City who are using the app between 2 and 4 a.m. are looking for other people who identify as women who are interested in whatever specific sexual interest and um, also like really love Groundhog Day. Um, and there was a second product that was called People, totally not creepy, that um, allowed <laughs> that allowed customers to um, maintain sort of individual profiles of users in their own in their own product that um, allowed them to send targeted content based on their behavior or their properties. So, anyway, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this sort of retargeting. It's to reincentivize engagement. Um, so, getting that out of the way, I thought I'd read a little bit about um, what it was like to work at a company that made a product like this, and just hopefully um, illuminate the ways that some of us talked about it. And, and just sorry, for, for context, I was doing customer support. So working with um, people at customer companies who were in you know, engineering or data analysis, that sort of thing, product management. <coughs> Forgive me. To do my job effectively, I had to be able to see customers' code as well as their dashboards. 
This was true of anyone in a customer-facing role. It was almost impossible to solve users' problems if the problems weren't in front of us. The simplest way for the analytics startup to achieve this was by granting those of us on the solutions team access to all of our customers' data sets, to see the tool as if we were logged into any given user's account to experience our product through their eyes. Some called this setting God mode. It wasn't our customers' payment, contact, and organizational information, though we could see that too if we needed to, but the actual data sets that they collected on their own users. This was a privileged vantage point from which to observe the tech industry, and we tried not to talk about it. We're not just selling jeans to miners, a coworker said. We're doing everyone's laundry. God mode was a business education. Engagement metrics could tell the story of a startup's entire lifespan. Startups rumored to be rocket ships sputtered to get off the ground. Gaming apps spiked and flamed out within weeks. The descent into obsolescence was almost always broken by cushions of venture capital, but we could see the directions things would go. We all knew that internal permissions limiting what we could see of customer data sets would come eventually. We also knew, at least for the time being, that it wasn't a priority for our engineering team. This level of employee access was normal for the industry, common for small new startups whose engineers were overextended. Employees at ride-sharing startups, I'd heard, could search customers' ride histories, tracking the travel patterns of celebrities and politicians. Even the social network everyone hated had its own version of God mode. Early employees had been granted access to users' private activity and passwords. Permissioning was effectively a rite of passage. It was a concession to the demands of growth. Besides, early employees were trusted like family. It was assumed we would only look at our customers' data sets out of necessity and, not, and only when requested by customers themselves, that we would not, under any circumstances, look up individual profiles of our lovers and family members and coworkers in the data sets belonging to dating apps and shopping services and fitness trackers and travel sites. We would not, out of sociological curiosity, surf through data sets of neighborhood watch platforms and online programs for Christian men trying to kick their masturbation habits. We would not pry. It was assumed that we wouldn't check back on past employers to see how they were faring without us. It was assumed we would never discuss the glaring inconsistencies between the public narratives spun around our startup customers and the stories that their data told. If we were to read breathless, frothy tech blog coverage about companies we suspected were failing, we would only smile and close the tab. It was assumed that if we had a publicly traded company using our software, and if so moved, could chart the overall health of that public company based on its data set, or build out predictive models of when its overall value might grow or recede, we would resist buying or selling its stock. Our tiny company of 20-somethings operated on good faith. If good faith failed, there was a thorough audit log of all employee behavior. The founders had implemented a product on our own back end, which tracked the customer data sets we looked at and the specific reports we ran. But nobody ever used the words insider trading. Nobody had a press contact. There was no policy on leaks. Not that we needed one. We were all, as the CEO liked to remind us, down for the cause. And if um, this is going OK, I'm going to read a little more. Um, you guys are really getting a fresh hit of that congested narration. Um, in the spring, the startup released a new feature, a report called Addiction. Addiction graphs displayed the frequency with which individual users engaged, visualized on an hourly basis, like a retention report on steroids. It was an inspired product decision executed brilliantly by the engineers. Every company wanted to build an app that users were looking at multiple times a day. They wanted to be sticky, stickiest. The addiction charts quantified and reinforced this anxiety and obsession. To promote addiction, I ghost wrote an opinion piece for the CEO that described, dryly, the desirability of having people constantly returning to the same apps multiple times an hour. Addiction allows companies to see how embedded they are into people's daily lives, I wrote, like it was a good thing. The piece was published on a highly trafficked tech blog under the CEO's name and on our company blog under mine. The novelty of addiction was exciting, but the premise made me uneasy. Most of the company was under the age of 30, and we had been raised on the internet. We all treated technology like it was inevitable, but I was starting to think that there might be other approaches. I already tied myself in dopamine knots all too often. I would email myself a link or a note, feel a jolt of excitement at the subsequent notification, and then remember I had just triggered it. Wow. <laughs> uh, 
solidarity. Um, app addiction wasn't something I wanted to encourage. The branding also vexed me. I knew multiple people who had decamped for pastoral settings to kick dependencies on heroin, cocaine, painkillers, alcohol, and they were the lucky ones. Addiction was a generational epidemic. It was devastating. There had to be higher aspirations. At the very least, there were other words in the English language. I brought up my qualms to a coworker. It was like nobody at the company had ever been around someone with even a casual drug habit, I said. It was like substance abuse was an abstract concept, something they'd only read about in the papers if any of them bothered to read the news in the first place. It wasn't just insensitive, but sheltered, embarrassing, offensive. We may as well call our funnel reports anorexia, I said. Let's start calling churn rate suicides. My coworker listened patiently while I ranted. He took off his floral cycling cap and rubbed the back of his head. I hear you, he said. The question of addiction is a big thing in gaming. It's nothing new, but I don't see any incentive for it to change. He pushed the miniature skateboard under my desk back and forth with the tip of his sneaker. We already call our customers users. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So one of the things that... Um, surprised me about working in analytics that I actually got really excited about initially was the sort of narrative potential of data. Um, I had studied sociology in college as, as an undergrad and was really drawn to theory and ethnography, but um, didn't spend a lot of time in quant classes uh, at the liberal arts college where I was a student. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my thesis was this like sort of pretentious investigation of evangelical popular culture and tensions between intent and form. So um, to then suddenly have access to this database of, of stories about how people were engaging with digital products or spending time online or you know, how they were integrating digital spaces into their physical lives. This was really fascinating to me. Um, it also illuminated the business models of a lot of these companies, uh, which of course is the sort of primary, um, I guess, criteria against which products are designed and user experience is designed and optimized. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I thought I would talk a little bit about narrative just for a few minutes and um, narrative and tech and then a little bit move into my um, own approach to this material. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so something I noticed working in tech and hanging out with people who work in tech and living in San Francisco in the time that I have been living there is that there are certain um, social currencies and one of them is the ability to speak passionately but uh, rationally. <laughs> um, and there is a sort of economic logic that tends to be applied to social issues, to um, emotional situations that has, um, that is respected and uh, has a lot of currency. So, um, you know, this is what I might call a data-driven argument or an unemotional, dispassionate argument. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this ties into a sort of pet interest of mine, which is the intellectual culture of Silicon Valley, which I would say is wanting. <clears throat> Excuse me, pardon. I'm not just doing that to, um, to be cute, because um, <laughs> it's adorable, I know. Uh, but yeah, the intellectual culture of Silicon Valley, I think, is really interesting and specific and um, relies on being a historical and very flattering to power, uh, anti-intellectual, but anyway, um, this is about narrative. <laughs> And so this value system that prizes a sort of uh, rational, logical, or you know, this uh, ostensibly logical approach to argument and information uh, manifests in a few different ways. And one of them is in the way different skill sets are valued. So um, hard skills like engineering and soft skills like communication, which are you know, sort of things that one might use in customer support or in marketing or sales. There's a hierarchy there where uh, hard skills are are more highly valued, obviously, than soft skills. And this hierarchy can often be used to discriminate against people on the basis of um, race or gender. Surprise, surprise. Um, so I found that dismissal and the undervaluing of soft skills really strange because storytelling, in my view, is essential to Silicon Valley. And um, in some ways, I think storytelling, and I mean this in like the, the way it's been co-opted by marketing, um, not in like the, you know, sit down with three children at your knee and like tell them a fairy tale. I think storytelling is one of Silicon Valley's primary exports. Um, I think the industry is sort of a triumphant uh, monument to branding. And the stories that the industry tells about itself um, were really seductive to me and I think have been seductive for decades and 
it's really only in recent years that this newest iteration um, is starting to get the criticism it deserves. Um, probably not even as much criticism as it deserves, in my view, but um, we can talk about that later. Uh, and, you know, the most pervasive story, I think, is that tech is different, that it's utopian, that it is um, a force for good. There's a lot of dramatic rebranding of libertarianism that's been going on, um, and I think that the industry has a self-image that it has promoted, that it's an underdog, um, that it's anti-institutional, anti-bureaucratic, meritocratic, and apolitical. Um, Ha <laughs> uh, ha. Obviously, a lot of utopian stories have always been a cover for social inequities. Um, and their implementation at the sort of corporate level can often lead to situations that are worse than what they are railing against. Um, so, for example, it's something I run up against a lot uh, in the book is this idea of meritocracy, which I might argue, having seen it um, implemented as a corporate structure, is actually usually a cover for the gross concentration of wealth and power um, among those who already benefit from deeply entrenched social hierarchies. So at an organization, for example, with a flat org chart, you actually wind up having rules and systems replaced with um, unarticulated social relationships. So tying into that and tying into the sort of meritocratic narrative is uh, the story that Silicon Valley tells about its own exceptionalism. And, um, of course, the narrative about technology itself as potentially a neutral platform. Um, these are really self-exonerating narratives, and, um, and they're really disengaged from reality. And I think uh, also this disengagement from politics is endemic to the industry. It's not just a new thing that has emerged um, with the rise of social platforms or e-commerce platforms like Amazon. Um, I figure with this crowd, I don't really need to go too deep onto that. But... Um, I think that the story of neutrality is one that those of us at the analytics startup that I worked for really benefited from, even if it wasn't something we were talking about explicitly. Um, and I don't know, I don't say this to be damning, I don't mean this in a, you know, to shame anyone. I think that um, there are no incentives for companies to make space for conversations about ethics. It's antithetical to the business model in a lot of ways, especially when you're working in a highly unregulated space like big data. Um, but I think it's very hard to see this when you're inside the machine. It's hard to even see the sort of stories that you are a part of or perpetuating. Um, and that's something that I'm sort of trying to get at in the book. Um, so I think, I don't know, as an aside, I think my other feeling about that is just that uh, if you're not getting it right on the level of a like relatively low stakes product analytics company, if you have um, employee access that is quite common to the industry, um, and you have a situation where um, this isn't even a conversation, I think that it's, it, it, it makes me fear for what's happening when the stakes are much higher. Um, I don't, I've never been inside Palantir. I don't know anything about Palantir. Um, there's obviously a great distance between product analytics uh, and state surveillance, but I feel like if you're not getting it right, um, on the low stakes side of the spectrum, I have low confidence that people are getting it right when the stakes are quite high. Um, anyway, so my hope with the book is to explore some of these issues through a personal narrative, through um, a different mode of storytelling, I guess. Uh, my hope is that that will illuminate the structural questions and the structural narrative, um, or structural narratives, I guess, about the industry. So. Um, I'm not an academic, as I'm sure you could tell by my complete fear at speaking to a, a room of people. <laughs> um, and I recently began working in journalism, but when I was working in tech, that was my primary focus. Um, I wrote some like personal essays that were a little, um, you know, the personal essays that one writes in their 20s about uh, themselves. <laughs> and um, I wrote the book as a personal story because it seemed emotionally honest to do that, and I also think that my experience was shaped by a lot of these sort of grand narratives in ways, for, for good and bad, um, for ways that I wouldn't have been able to articulate as uh, a tech worker. Um, which is not to say that this is a book, the book's not a polemic, but it's also not apolitical, obviously. Um, and I think that there is great political utility, or I hope that there is political utility in describing how people in positions of power and influence um, talk about their work, talk about technology, what they eat, how they spend their money, um, who the intellectual figures in their world are, what sorts of arguments are persuasive to them. Um, 
the book's largely ambivalent. I think that, you know, I think ambivalence can be generative, and I think that we're at a pretty pivotal moment and have been for some time, so maybe it's a sort of um, pregnant p- pivotal moment. But um, my hope is that this can be useful in just explaining how it feels to be kind of entry level on the ground floor experiencing this rather than trying to synthesize it from too far of a distance. Um, and lastly, just to this point of narrative, I want to try to book about tech that wasn't on tech's own terms. Um, I think that for a really long time, the industry has controlled the narrative about itself and has really benefited from that, obviously. Um, and right now, we're seeing a sort of a whiplash um, effect, I think, and we're seeing the the loss of that control has been very destabilizing for a lot of people in the industry. Um, but I didn't name companies or executives in the book in part to reject these self-serving stories of individualism and exceptionalism. Um, I'm not interested in this sort of triumphalist narratives. I'm not interested in telling stories that are flattering to power, and I hope that I have not. Um, but I wanted to write something that did feel true to me and to my experience, and one that rejected the dominant values of the industry. So to that end, this is not a cool-headed, rational, polemical, data-driven book. Um, thank God, <laughs> it would be so bad. Um, but instead, I aim to make an argument on the basis of two things that are antithetical to that approach, um, which are personal observation and feeling. So I thought I would end with just another small reading um, from the book. Uh, So there was this, I should explain, uh, sort of internal slogan, DFTC, or down for the cause. And this was something that was invoked when people went above and beyond their job responsibilities. Um, So if you were really hustling for the company, you were being down for the cause. Um, Totally something that can't be abused or, uh, (laughs) um, anyway. So I just have a short riff on that that I'll read for you now. Down for the cause. What was the cause? Our cause was the company, but the company had causes too. Driving engagement, improving the user experience, reducing friction, enabling digital dependency. We were helping marketing managers A-B test subject line copy to increase click-throughs from mass emails, helping developers at e-commerce platforms make it harder for users to abandon shopping carts, helping designers tighten the endorphin feedback loop. Helping make people make better decisions, we'd always said. Helping people test their assumptions, answer tough questions, eliminate bias, develop best of breed message targeting, increase conversions, improve key business metrics, measure user adoption strategy, prioritize impact, drive ROI, growth hack. What gets measured gets managed, I sometimes told customers, quoting a management guru whose writing I had never read. (laughs) The end game was the same for everyone, growth at any cost, scale above all, disrupt, then dominate. At the end of the idea, a world improved by companies improved by data, a world of actionable metrics in which developers would never stop optimizing and users would, users would never stop looking at their screens. A world freed of decision making, the unnecessary friction of human behavior, where everything whittled down to the fastest, simplest, sleekest version of itself could be optimized, prioritized, monetized, and controlled. Unfortunately for me, I liked my inefficient life. I liked listening to the radio and cooking with excessive utensils, slivering onions, detangling wet herbs, long showers and stoned museum wandering. I liked riding public transportation, watching strangers talk to their children, watching strangers stare out the window at the sunset and at photos of the sunset on their phones. I liked taking long walks to purchase on a giri in Japantown or taking long walks with no destination at all, folding the laundry, copying keys, filling out forms, phone calls, I even liked the post office, the predictable discontent of bureaucracy. I liked full albums flipping the record, long novels with minimal plot, minimalist novels with minimal plot, (laughs) engaging with strangers, getting into it, closing down the restaurant, having one last drink. I liked grocery shopping, perusing the produce, watching everyone chew in the bulk aisle. Warm laundry, radio, waiting for the bus. I could get frustrated, overextended, overwhelmed, uncomfortable. Sometimes I ran late. But these banal inefficiencies, I thought they were luxuries, the mark of the unencumbered. Time to do nothing, to let my mind run anywhere, to be in the world. At the very least, they made me feel human. The fetishized life without friction, what was it like? 
an unending shuttle between meetings and bodily needs, a continuous productive loop, charts and data sets. It wasn't to me an aspiration. It was not a prize. Thank you. Um, first of all, you're a New Yorker, right? I am, yes. Welcome home. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I, I needed to say that. Thanks, Sam. Um, and thank you for the wonderful reading. Um, I have a few questions, and then I'd love to open it up to our guests in the space for a Q&A. Um, I think something that really struck me about this book, beyond it being fabulous, is that tech is really known for its sort of allergy to critique, right? Um, and it's impressive how this memoir doesn't drift into direct polemic, no matter how it might feel you know, richly deserved at times. Um, it's really compelling that it unfolds sort of in this rhythmic parallel to tech lash as it emerges in the news cycle um, and regulatory conversations in the public mind. And I wanna ask you how you thought about making critique either implicit or explicit as you are writing this. And also, I mean, you should be commended because as a narrator, you don't hold back on critiquing yourself. And some of the portraits, for those of you who've read the book, if you haven't, um, there are a lot of really thoughtful um, vignettes about coworkers and even different company CEOs that are rendered with a real curiosity, and, and even I would say like an empathy or a tenderness. So how did you make those choices about depiction as you wrote? Um, well, obviously I got a little polemical up there, but yeah, it's true. The book is not a polemic, and I didn't want it to be. I didn't want to come from a place of contempt. Um, tech is an industry, a lot of people in tech, I sh tech is an industry where um, Leaders are not just sensitive to criticism, but I would say actively hostile to criticism. And we're seeing that right now. My, my feeling is that this is largely because um, the industry went uncriticized by most people for so long. And so there's kind of this reckoning and this really dramatic uh, rupture of, of the industry's self-image, insofar as an industry can have a self-image, but the stories that um, leadership has been telling itself for a very long time about what these companies do and what their role in the world is. Um, I personally, this is very interesting to me this moment because I think that what is happening is a, one of the responses to criticism of the industry is um, an effort to discredit the free press. And um, we're seeing that in some subtle ways. A particular blog post comes to mind for those of you who follow Paul Graham. Um, he recently published something about haters um, this also manifests in more um, insidious ways, I think, or more blatant ways, such as um, Mark Zuckerberg trying to rewrite the history of Facebook um, on national television as um, not as a way to rate the attractiveness of his peers, but as a response to concerns on the Harvard campus about the Iraq war. Um, which is astonishing revision. Uh, just so brazen, you know, it's amazing that someone who's runs like a essentially a surveillance company would think they could get away with that. Yeah. Um, but which is all just to say that in thinking about how I wanted to leverage my own criticism, the book ends in 2016 for the most part, um, the end of 2016. And I would say that the backlash we're seeing to the industry, it's not even a backlash. I sort of hesitate to frame it that way because I think it is a... Um, well-deserved and still fairly minimal um, mm, treatment, a very realistic treatment of power. And um, I think that that all started to tip around the end of 2016. Um, but from 2012 to 2016, I wasn't thinking in these terms. And so I wanted, it is a memoir, it's a personal story, I wanted to be honest about my um, my own experience and how I saw the world, and I also thought that that would be more useful than um, than a sort of blatant critique. Um, in part, this is also just knowing how to stay in my own lane. I am not an academic. I'm only recently started 
to be a journalist or, you know, I don't, I'm not a pundit, uh, despite having strong opinions about everything. But um, I, I am hopeful that in many cases in the book, the criticism, the critique makes itself. Um, I think giving people time to speak and uh, just kind of laying out the details makes the argument uh, for itself. In many ways, you don't, you know, I, I sort of, I trust my readers to be smart and to put it together. Um, and I think that I also just wanted to err on the side of generosity. Um, and to give people the benefit of the doubt because I didn't come into this book with contempt. Um, I'm writing about people I worked with and worked for and everyone, you know, I, I think I often end up giving the benefit of the doubt to people who don't deserve it, but I still wanted to extend that um, as best as I could. So that is sort of where I'm coming from on both of those issues. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> for sure. You know, I'd love to dig a little deeper on the mechanism of memoir as a genre, and actually its relationship to these conversations around accountability. Uh, there's a really intimate first person account of this book, and this book of working and living as you know, data privacy becomes a bigger part of the public debate as pervasive new tools and tactics of surveillance are being revealed and we get the narrator's your you know, dawning awareness of um, accountability and where your place might be in this entire schematic. Um, so, you know, you didn't start with the intention of reporting from inside these companies, right? That's right. Right. So this isn't, you know, the boy kings, but you do wor write about working at a data analytics startup where you have access to user information in this God mode. Those of us who've uh, learned about um, companies like Uber, know what that is. Um, you mentioned the Snowden revelations come up a couple of times. Um, and then about working at this open source startup, grappling with free expression versus some pretty insidious online harassment. So we're talking values, responsibility, self-awareness. Um, why did you decide to write a memoir and not something you know more pointed? and? What do you think the role is of Uncanny Valley um, in the sort of pantheon of uh, more direct accountability reporting on tech? It's a really interesting question. Um, so yeah, I, to, I never intended to write about this. I um, had this, had I wanted to write a piece of journalism, I would have had to take really, really good notes. Um, and that was never what I was hoping to do, um, so I did not take the notes that one would take for a piece of journalism. Um, I think that there was, so I, I used to work in the book publishing industry, and when I was working in tech, I would write these long emails to friends, basically being like, my life in San Francisco is bizarre, I have no friends, and I'm in the office all the time, and I love it. Like, just it just was, it was a strange time. Um, and um, some of them would joke, you know, save it for your novel. Like I would t tell them about some of my coworkers and they would say, put it in the novel later. Um, but I never intended to write a novel. And I wrote this piece for N Plus One that the book came out of in 2015 and it was published in 2016. That was supposed to be a book review and then it just became anecdotes and then I realized that there was more that I wanted to say, but I put it aside thinking, okay, maybe I will write a novel in my 40s, like when I'm far beyond, you know, when I've established myself in this career and my life looks a little different and this, you know, I have some distance. Um, and, excuse me, I'm like struggling to breathe, forgive me. Um, uh, and then the election happened and at the end of 2016 and I had sort of assumed that I would write about it all later because um, it would all just keep going. That I was living in something that was not going to change, um, that that this was just the way the world was um, in San Francisco. And obviously things, structurally things haven't really changed at all, um, and they weren't new to begin with, but I think that the response to tech and the scrutiny has definitely shifted, and um, I felt like whatever I thought was going to keep going actually had come to an end in some way, and I wanted to document that quickly before I lost it. Um, 
And memoir to me just seemed like the most honest genre. I think that I could have gone back and done research and reported it out and put together like an oral history of the companies that I worked for. Um, but I didn't see why I would do that because I, in many ways I don't think the companies I worked for specifically are very important. I think that they represent certain things about um, the incentives of the tech industry or the incentives of capitalism. Uh, and certainly it's significant that I worked in a company that was in the big data space and one that was uh, hosting user-generated content. But um, a memoir just seemed most honest and I, I felt like if I wrote it as a novel the way my friends had joked for a while that um, it would be dismissed as satire, especially as a woman, especially as someone whose experience was in non-technical roles. Um, I felt that the material to not take it seriously was there, uh, <laughs> you know, or not the material, but my those characteristics would be reason for people in the industry to not take it seriously. And um, though I did not write this book for them, I do hope that they read it. And uh, memoir just seemed like like the best way to, to illuminate what I was hoping to capture. That's really helpful. I have one last question before Q&A, and thank you for your, your endurance. It's cold and flu season here at Data and Society in New York. I'm in recovery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine to talk to, I hope. Okay. Um, you write, you know, I love this um, passage. You write, it was a year of promise, excess, optimism, acceleration and hope in some other industry in someone else's life. Your depictions of our generation's relationship to scale and wealth and power are so evocative in this memoir. Are you interested in following this story? I mean, will you keep writing about this? What does it look like after you've, you know, produced such an incredible first person account to be reporting in this space looking forward. Yeah, I mean, this is a world I'm still writing about now as a journalist, which is a very different style of writing, um, has different constraints, has different, uh, in many ways, I actually find it a much more soothing way to write because everything has to have a source. And um, rather than, you know, memory or interviews with former coworkers about something that happened four years ago. Anyway, I think that the reporting is quite different from the memoir. Um, and so it also room, leaves, makes room to uh, interrogate other questions. So one of the questions that wouldn't be appropriate to write about in a memoir, because it would just, it would be um, pedantic and weird. One of the questions I have is, you know, in Silicon Valley you have this concentration of wealth and power um, in the hands of very few people who are quite young. And I want to know what they're going to do with that wealth and how will that manifest politically and will we see people from the industry move into politics explicitly? Will we see the emergence of, um, you know, the next generation of Koch brothers? Will there be some acknowledgement of the actual politics of people in this industry? It's not as liberal as um, I think many want to believe, even many who would say that they have liberal politics. Um, I think that that's going to be the thing that I want to make, be paying the most attention to. I, I'm also very curious about um, people who are, who are working in and around technology who are not treating this all as inevitable. I think that was in one of the passages that I read. but. Uh, for me, I feel like this can change, and I have to be optimistic about that because it feels so dismal right now in so many ways. Um, and so I am curious what, you know, what are the other directions this could go? Um, can this get better? Can it, can it you know, have some sense of ethics and um, a, a moral framework that makes sense moving forward? So, yeah, so writing about this, I think it still has captured my interest. I think that the... Um, the writing about a sort of generational pull to the industry is, is, that's interesting to me too, right? I mean, I think that there are people who have all of these external <laughs> reasons to work in tech, whether they have student debt or they have dependents or um, they would be working in academia if it didn't feel like institutions were collapsing. Um, what is the response people have to institutional erosion that isn't just 
going to work for a tech company? What else can emerge? Um, and if and if that is sort of happening, like a brain drain situation, maybe, um, you know, what what are those people thinking? What are they not not in a judgmental way, but how do they? What's their relationship to their work, and um, what power do they have that they could leverage to make things better reflect their own ideals or or visions? So. So it's about institutions and expertise and who decides. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to open it up to our guests here um, in the office. Um, do we have a mic available? Yeah, in the row pets. Hi, I'm Adam. Hi. I'm a student at Union Theological Seminary. So that will definitely be something that shapes my question to you, which is in the book, you mentioned kind of um, design shaping almost like a religion, people suspending their disbelief. And then just now in the talk, you were mentioning how your undergraduate thesis was about evangelical culture. And I was wondering if um, when you were in Silicon Valley and over your time writing this book, whether there was some kind of religious component to how you were thinking about um, your time in Silicon Valley. I do, I do think people are looking for a value system. I do think people, there are a lot of people who are looking for something. And a lot of the culture around tech is related to that, whether that has to do with um, sort of obsessive body quantification and optimization or um, the fervent belief in a corporate mission. I do think there are elements of um, religious organizations or religious, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not gravity, but um, what attracts someone to a religion. But but I, th I think that coming up with a theory is like is, is a little too high level even for me. Um, I wouldn't dare do that. I don't think it's, I think it's similar. There's like a similar tone, but it's not, um, it's not a one-to-one. -one. I'd be curious what you make of it. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Aaron, I'm a computer hacker and museum curator. Um, I was wondering if, um, it, is any group of people who commit to being a company, specifically a tech company, um, are they just completely doomed, or could you, imagine, could you imagine like a model or infrastructure that they can use to ensure that uh, they don't become as poisonous as the ones that have come before them? Is there any sort of heuristic you might be able to think of? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, also, hacker and museum curator is such a great life. Uh, sorry, I'm just like, who are you? <laughs> How did you figure this out? Um, yeah, I think that a lot of the problems that, um, the underlying problems of the current startup ecosystem have to do with the business model and the funding structure. And the corporate culture is often a reflection of the interests and incentives of, of that model. So um, right now we're seeing companies being rewarded for speed and super growth, high growth really quickly, scale. Um, and there's obviously this orientation toward monetization, privatization, um, centralization. And uh, if you're an internet company and you don't have a concrete product, uh, add an ad-based model. Um, so, you know, data collection. <laughs> and uh, sorry, that's not specific to ad-based models, but um, surveillance, I don't know. Anyway. I think that if you have a product that isn't oriented toward those things, you'll probably have a difficult time um, in the market. But at the moment, this is where I reserve hope, though. I think things can change. I hope that they can. Um, but I also would say that in terms of like organization of a company, it has to do just with power. Um, who has ownership of the company? What does that actually look like? If it has a sort of traditional company structure rather than like a co-op, um, are there employee seats on the board? Is uh, is it actually like collectively run, or is this sort of concept of equity and co-ownership like a throwaway um, meant to keep employees really committed? I, I think that there are different ways you can structure an organization that can um, save you from doom. I think was the, you use the word doomed, uh, and those are worth looking into. But I couldn't I couldn't point you to concrete examples in the tech industry. I'm sure someone in this room could um, of of startups that are organized in that way. I think it's sort of antithetical to the, the funding structure and to the marketplace. Uh, we have a lot of um, academic, para-academic, corporate, et cetera, perspectives in the room. And I really encourage you and everyone to 
connect with our research team, some of whom uh, I see in the back, to keep exploring these questions. I want to thank you for your very generous ideas and questions for our guest, and thank you, Anna Wiener, so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.